uh, thank you for having me here. I'm happy. Uh, so I'll be talking about the sums of squares problem and uh, the Could you speak louder, please? Or does it work? turn the mic up? Or oh, something? Is it even on? Probably not. It should be light at the top of the bottom. There we go. It's better now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So sums of squares problem and uh, families of anti-committing uh, matrices. Uh, uh, the sums of squares problem is one of my favorite problems about polynomials. I don't know how to solve it. So uh, basically this talk is more about advertising the problem than my own work about it. Uh, the problem is very nice. So uh, it's the following. So the sum of sums of squares problem. Uh, you have the following polynomial, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared times y1 squared plus y2 squared plus y1 squared. And you want to write it as a sum of squares, f1 squared, f2 squared plus fk squared, where f's are some uh, real polynomials. And you want to know how many such squares you need. Uh, to be more exact, I, I want to know, uh, given an n, what is the smallest smallest k such that there exist real polynomials through fk so that uh, the following identity holds. I will denote s of n the smallest such k. It's a very simple question. You can uh, see quite easily that the trivial bounds on s of n is somewhere between n squared and n. The upper bound is easy because if you just open the brackets, then you will just uh, write this thing as simply sum of all x i y j squared. So you need n squared. Well, actually, it should be probably n squared over 2 or n choose 2, something like that. Um, <coughs> Or n squared. Yeah, sorry, n squared. So the O there. Uh, yes, uh, to, to see the lower bound, uh, it's uh, an exercise that you can complete. Uh, actually, the upper bound can be a little bit improved, and you can actually get uh, O of n squared over log n. Uh, and we will see where the log comes from a little bit later. But this is essentially the best upper bound. This is the best upper bound that we know on this question. It also shows that the trivial uh, uh, upper bound is not uh, what you will be getting. The, uh, I assume this is clear. It's a nice Can question. Can I ask a really naive question? If, if I replace all the x squareds with x's and all the y squareds with y's, I have a really easy problem there. So like, what, what's going on? Uh, you will replace. Uh, Take the product of two linear forms, then that's easy to write as well. You want to over complex numbers? Maybe I'm asking oh, a different okay. question. If you ask this question over complex numbers, then any polynomial over complex numbers can be written as a sum of two squares. So over algebraically closed fields, this, this format, is the product of two. Yeah. Uh, no, any polynomial, anything can be written. Like you can write, okay, you can write f as something like f plus one squared minus f minus one squared over four, and you take the square root. Uh, so over complex numbers, this question, if you want to make this question meaningful, you and actually like the formulation over complex numbers better that you would add the extra conditions that the real polynomials would be complex polynomials, but you would require them to be homogeneous of degree 2 and bilinear in the variables x and y. So I actually would prefer to state it over complex numbers in this way, using the condition of bilinearity on the f's, 
uh, but I didn't want to get into it, so I chose the real numbers. Thank you for the question. Of course, if you figure out the trivial upper bound, which is like 2n, I'll be very happy to know that. Because my guess would be that this is actually the correct answer uh, for this function. Uh, I, I should also say that I don't really care about the exact value of n. I, I just want to know whether it looks more like n or it looks more like n squared. Uh, so is it more like a linear function or more like a quadratic function? Uh, that's the main question. The <coughs> reason why I was interested in this was that a long time ago with uh, Wigderson, Yehudayov, show that if you can prove that Sn is of this form, so if you show that it is superlinear for some sum bigger than zero, then you get uh, circuit lower bounds. Circuit lower bounds in some model that I will not describe, but that was the original motivation. So originally, I wanted uh, uh, to know whether the <coughs> uh, you can get linear number of squares or whether you need superlinear. So this was the original application. Uh, in the meantime, I completely forgot about it, and I think this is interesting in its in itself. Yes. Does it feel matter? I mean, what? Uh, that's a good question. I think it shouldn't. Uh, so as long as the field is of characteristics different than two, if the field has characteristics two, then the problem really trivializes. But uh, uh, I think the problem makes sense for every field, uh, as long as you, uh, again, insist that those Fs are uh, bilinear. And I don't see why the field should matter, but I cannot prove that it's field independent. So uh, I would guess that over any field, this is the correct so, answer. So Russian answers versus real answers. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it should be the same. We but think I, it's the same? Well, I think it is the same, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to prove that. Uh, <coughs> yes, well, it, it could happen that like uh, you could use some irrational numbers here. I don't know why it should uh, should help or not. Could could you say just a word about what kind of circuit lower bounds for what? Uh, the, so uh, there is a it's arithmetic circuits. So are circuits which compute polynomials, but it's actually arithmetic circuits which uh, use non-commutative gates. So you assume that multiplication is non-commutative. Uh, you can think about uh, it uh, that you are computing over a matrix algebra or something like that. So it's a very simple model, but we still don't know lower bounds for, for this uh, type of circuits. And solving this question should uh, would prove a lower bound. Uh, I don't remember now whether I said it, but uh, this is not, in order to make this work, you actually need to work over algebraically closed field. Uh, that is not in this formulation. So this is sort of a little bit of a cheat. <coughs> but uh, the reason why uh, the, this question was interesting to, to people much earlier, uh, which you may be familiar with, for uh, people are interested in specific values of the function, in specific identities of this form. And uh, so uh, I'll just give you a few values of this function S1 for powers of 2. So here you get just the identity x1, y1 squared is x1, y1 squared. Now if you look at this case, the case of 2 squares, there is a nice formula which says The only reason why I remember it is that uh, it is very simple interpretation. So if you think about the complex number x1 plus ix2 as a complex number, which is y1 plus y1, then, then this thing is the norm of the complex number x squared plus y squared 
Now this is the real part of the product and this is the imaginary part of the product. So, so this expresses the identity that uh, the norm of complex numbers is multiplicative. Uh, there is a similar identity which I will not write down uh, for four squares, uh, which expresses the same fact for uh, quaternions. And uh, the, the identity was discovered before quaternions, and it was due to Euler, I think. And there is a similar identity for S of A is equal to A, <coughs> which uh, expresses the same fact for O. Now, if you look at this sequence, people probably thought for a while that uh, this will go forever, and you will have S of 16 is equal to 16. Uh, but Hurwitz proved in late 18th, 19th century. So the equal is a less than or equal, right? No, it's exactly equal. We, uh, you oh, know, sorry, you S of n is always at least n, and uh, so the trivial part, of course, is less of it, but it's equality. Uh, so Hurwitz proved, and if I have the time, I will sketch this theorem in a moment, that uh, those are actually the only cases where the equality holds. Otherwise, uh, you must have strict inequality. And he proved that S of n is equal to n if and only if n is either 1, 2, 4, 8. So in all the other cases, n must be strictly, S of n must be strictly bigger than n. <coughs> <coughs> so the natural guess for the continuation of the pattern would be something like Clifford algebra. Excuse me. The natural guess for the continuation of the pattern would be something like Clifford algebras. Oh yes, uh, that's yeah. the. Uh, the uh, this is very related to Clifford well, there's algebra. Al there's also there's a sequence of, of algebras of, of order two to the n, which are weaker and weaker conditions that people yes. discovered, uh, yeah. you know, and, and that's that's all. But they're they're not normed in the sense of yeah. so that's probably more. Normal. Yeah, but Clifford algebras you still have the kind of structure you want here. Yeah, but uh, the yeah. Uh, the natural way how to continue the sequence is through Clifford algebras, uh, but then you, uh, it no longer gives sums of squares formulas because you don't have the norm uh, notion. Uh, yes. <coughs> so this is the problem. This is probably the nicest thing you can say about the problem. There are a lot of other nice things which I will not go into. Uh, now, how does it relate to families of anti-commuting matrices? So uh, it relates because uh, I had a very beautiful approach how to solve this problem, and uh, it turned out I actually can't. So the only thing that came out of it is the following conjecture, which I will state. I will give you a few things that I uh, know about it, which would s somehow resolve this problem. So the conjecture is the following. So let's have matrices E1 through EK, which now will be complex n by n matrices, uh, which are anti-commutative. Uh, by this I mean simply that EI times EJ is equal to minus EJEI uh, whenever I is not equal to J. I apologize, I write subscripts with capitals. It's not an ideal, it's just a natural number. Okay, so, so uh, if you take any, uh, the matrix is anti commute, uh, any two matrices is anti commute. Uh, then the following holds. If you take the matrices, you square them. Then you get at most O and O and. So the, the statement is trying to tell you that if you, it's not easy to construct anti-commutative mat matrices. Anti-commutative is, is quite a strong condition. Some of the ranks. Some of the ranks. This is the rank. So uh, it's not easy to construct anti-commuting matrices. This is trying to tell you that if you uh, have a set of anti-commuting matrices, then the ranks of the matrices of the family cannot be too large. Is it squared on the inside or the outside? It's on the inside. 
Uh, that's quite important. I will mention it. Well, I can as well mention it right now. So one way how to bound this, of course, would be to bound just the sum of the ranks instead of the ranks squared. But uh, one thing about this is that the sum of the ranks, as you see, uh, doesn't depend on k at all. It should depend only on the dimension of the space that the matrix is living. If you were trying to uh, consider the sum of the ranks, uh, it uh, would no longer be the case. Because if you look at well, the, the simplest way how to construct anti-commuting matrices, it's think about two by two matrices which look like this. If you take any two matrices of this kind, you get a zero. Uh, but over complex numbers, you have infinitely many such matrices. So uh, if you were counting the sum of the ranks, you would be getting a number which is as large as you wish or can be infinite if you allow the family to be infinite. So that's one reason why, I, uh, why you are counting the, the rank squared. Is that the rank of the matrix squared or the rank squared? The rank of the matrix squared. Uh, so, is the clock okay, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Great. So that's why the square is inside, not on the outside. If the rank was on the outside, uh, the uh, the upper bound could be any number you want, uh, which could be arbitrarily large. Uh, the reason why this is uh, this conjecture is def designed so that. Uh, it implies that uh, that Sn is actually so it Im implies that this bound is tight. Uh, that's one reason why I believe it because it seems uh, 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 it's uh, <coughs> would imply what I want, but I uh, spent a lot of time trying to find a country example. I couldn't find it either. Another reason why this is uh, uh, why one would think that the log, uh, why the, the formula looks like n log n here and n squared over log n here is a simple fact which uh, is actually a fact which is used in the proof of the Hurwitz's theorem, which is that if you have uh, e1 through ek, which are anti-commutative. And full rank. Uh, then k is at most 2 log 2. And <coughs> In other words, one way how to uh, if you wanted to obtain your family of anti-commuting uh, anti matrices by having the rank of each matrix to be as large as possible, namely to have full rank, uh, then the number of such matrices will be at most uh, roughly log n. And in this case, actually, this <coughs> bound is achieved. So uh, w what you are trying to say here is that the best thing you can do in order to construct a family of anti-commuting matrices is indeed to take matrices of really high rank and uh, somehow everything else you can do is, uh, will be just worse or at least it will not be better. L state. Okay, I, I thought I'll have time to sketch you a proof of this thing because it's a really nice theorem uh, which I will not have time to do but uh, which involves proving this statement, which is uh, uh, elementary and nice. But instead, I will state uh, two things that uh, one can prove about this. One thing is that this quantity is actually bounded by some function of n. So at least it's not an infinite thing. Uh, more exactly, uh, you can prove that if e1 through ek are anti-commuting, and for all i, ei squared is not equal to 0, which you can always assume because otherwise you just throw the matrix away. Uh, this implies that <coughs> k 
is at most 2A. So if you have the condition that you have an anticommitting family of matrices, each of them squares to something which is non-zero, unlike in this case, because all of those matrices squared to zero, then the number of such matrices must be finite and in particular is bounded by 2n, which also implies that the sum of the rank <coughs> squared is at most uh, roughly n squared. Okay, so instead of getting n log n, you can get at least n squared. And another thing uh, one can prove is that uh, um, <clears throat> again, if you have a family of anticommuting matrices, then the following holds. There exists an R, which is always smaller than n, such that instead of summing the squares the ranks of the squares of the matrices, you sum the ranks of EI to R, <coughs> and this is indeed bounded by <coughs> uh, <coughs> so. Uh, Obviously, as if you are increasing powers of the matrices, the rank will be going down, or at least it's not going to go up. So the higher and higher powers of EIs you take, and uh, you are counting the ranks, the rank will go down. What is this telling you? That it's enough to take uh, the power to be, let's say, n, and uh, uh, the conjecture will be true if you replace this 2 by, say, n. One corollary of this is obviously that if you take diagonalizable matrices, diagonalizable matrices have the property that EI squared is, the rank of EI squared is still EI. Uh, <coughs> so this implies that if uh, E1 through EK uh, are diagonal diagonalizable, by which I mean each of them is diagonalizable separately, not that they would be diagonalizable together, then actually the rank <coughs> EI is at most L. And here we don't need a square. <coughs> well, so this is pretty much that I know about it. The punchline of this is that uh, the hard case, if you look at this thing, is actually the case when uh, each matrix EI is nilpotent. That's the most problematic case because if it's nilpotent, then you raise it to a power of n and it just vanishes. So this theorem tells you absolutely nothing. Uh, also, of course, nilpotent matrices are not diagonalizable, so uh, here you also get nothing. So really, the uh, the bottleneck of this whole uh, thing is to uh, make it work for uh, nilpotent matrices. And, uh, or if you have some other idea how to deal with this question, I'd be happy if you solve it in some other way. And if you have uh, even a counterexample to this conjecture, it would also make me very happy. Thank you. Yes. So have you tried topological methods for this conjecture? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, it looks like you know the old one is vector fields on sphere. This yeah. could be something like vector bundle on sphere. Yes. That's uh, well. I uh, I did try, and this guy, um, Mr. Amir Yehudov, he did try. Uh, also, and then we sort of came to the conclusion that uh, in those topological methods you work hard and hard and then you get here a factor of two. Yeah, but I, I just meant for this specific conjecture. Uh, for this specific conjecture, no, because uh, I thought, uh, well, those are just matrices. But uh, the, the, the theorem you are referring to is that uh, somehow this statement really uses the fact that uh, uh, you have full rank matrices. No, no, that, that's why I said vector bundle and not yeah. vector field. 
because uh, this, the vector bundle will give you extra flexibility. No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. Uh, if you have like an idea how to do it, I would be very happy. Well, we could talk, but I don't know if it's worth anything. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Yes, about Barry. experiments with sum of squares optimization. Uh, you mean a computer? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we were trying to force some grad students to implement it, and nobody was uh, willing to do it, and I don't know how to program. But, uh, if you are offering uh, uh, that, that you will do it, I'll be. Uh, you solved my problem. <laughs> no, like, uh, the, uh, the, the problem is, okay, yes. Well, I, think it's a, I think it's such a charming test case to, to try to find a low rank point on this uh, spectrum, ground spectrum. Yeah, but we thought, okay, seriously, we, we thought about it, and now, uh, like, the values of these functions are pretty known exactly up to, like, 10. For 16, it's roughly, uh, it's uh, known that the number is somewhere between 32 and something else. But uh, I think even for 16, it's impossible to state this in a feasible way that you could actually get something. So... Uh, I don't think we have computational power to handle even the case of 16. Well, let's say n equals 6. What's the set of all representations? <coughs> oh, for there's a, a semi-algebraic set of all representations of this kind. For 6, I think that, like up to 10, the, the answer is completely known. And like there are, I'm not very good with references, but there is a lot of literature about this. And a lot of literature actually focused, or most of literature focused on computing the exact values of this function. I don't mean the value, I mean the set of oh. all representations. Uh, I would guess it also has been done, but uh, the, the, I, I just don't know how it would generalize for, for general n. Can we assume in the original formulation of the problem that these real polynomials are bilingual? That's a, that's a very good point, so without loss. I know. Which, of course, was the case here, and it's the case in, in general. So, with your conjecture, is there an elementary sort of large block matrix whose rank is O of n log n if the uh, entries you commute? Is there some statement? Uh, could you repeat it? So I'm wondering if you have a large blocked matrix whose blocks are either 0 or E1 through EK, whose rank is this number that you're looking ah, for. Uh, yeah, well, that's actually... Uh, yes. I mean, if I have a block matrix oh, okay. with the squares on the diagonal, then fine. But yeah, then I'm asking, maybe it comes from a different construction. So uh, this is actually one other way how to phrase the sum of squares problem. Which uh, so, if you take those matrices, you write them like this. Uh, <coughs> so then, on the diagonals, you have those EI squares, and if you look at this block and the complementary block on the other side, they are the opposite of each other. Um, <coughs> That's one observation. If you want to solve the sum of squares problem, you can phrase it uh, completely differently, in a, so, which looks somewhat like the picture over there. So think about the following matrix, which is divided into blocks. And the matrix will have size n squared by n squared. And you will have n blocks, each of size n by n. Now the condition is that on the diagonal, you will have the identity matrix, that is n by n identity matrix. <coughs> And if you look at this block and the complementary block, so the E, here you must have minus E. So that's the constraint on the matrix. <coughs> and what you want to do, you want to minimize the rank of such a matrix. So the trivial way how to, uh, if you just write the off-diagonal blocks to be zeros, then the rank will be n squared. The question is, can you fill in those matrices which satisfy the anti-symmetric condition in such a way that the rank will drop to, let's say, n? Of course, you can't make it smaller than n because there are those identities sitting here. But the question is, like, where does the rank of this matrix sit? So uh, that may be like a 
nicer way how to formulate this problem, except I don't know how to attack this uh, version at all. But maybe a computer could handle this. Yes, so thank you. Yes.